<laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the last normal TWED of the um, fall uh, 2019 season. We've got a uh, holiday week. There's an R Pirates, RPI, our users group meeting. And then on the, um, this, this, yeah, this is the 11th or the 12th? 11th. The, the 11th of December is our end of the term uh, TWED lightning talks, where all of you, the RPI students and staff, if they're interested, have the opportunity to talk for two minutes and give a lightning talk on whatever you want to talk about, um, your, your research or whatever. And it's a wonderful time. We pack this room. Uh, so tonight, Niha is going to lead us in a discussion of, this is your, your research direction. That's, what, yes. that's pretty much what it is. So it's, um, and we, we think we have our uh, system of recording video and recording uh, the shared slides all worked out. I'm making, I'm making recordings of these talks and I post them to the TWEG channel. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. You're welcome to ask questions. Uh, uh, just keep in mind that you are being recorded for internet posterity. So without further ado, take it away, Niha. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Neha Keshan, and I'm going to talk about semantically enabled infrastructure for integrated data resources in industries. Now, before we get into the infrastructure thing, let's look at some of the semantic technologies. So two big the, uh, semantic technologies, according to me, is the ontology and the knowledge graph. And most of the times that I have seen is people uh, people mix the terms ontology and the knowledge graph, and they use it interchangeably. Uh, so I would just first uh, would like to say what, it, what they are based on my knowledge, and according to me, how are they different? So first is the ontology. Ontology is technically a schema that is generated based on the data that we have. And when we add those instances of data in this ontology, in the schema created using that, then it becomes a knowledge graph. For example, when we have, say, a data sheet with rows of courses and the instructors, so I can say in ontology, like courses as are being instructed by instructors, that will be my ontology, but the instances like semantic technologies being taught by Professor Deborah McGuinness will be an instance, and that will be a part of my knowledge graph. So there's a very light difference between ontology and knowledge graph. So that's very important that we should know. Now, uh, the ontology and knowledge graph can be represented using the resource description framework, the RDA framework, which is very famous. And to do that, there are many tools. One of them is the semantic extract, transform, and load tool that, that was created at this lab, where we just use JSON, LD, uh, Jinja templates, and Python expressions to use the data in different formats, say XML or CSV, as we see one on the um, left, the table. And then we can convert all these data from different formats into one same, into a similar format of RDF. And then this RDF can then be um, queried upon using Sparkle query to find whatever we want which really makes things very simple. So say we have this uh, data over here, which we have ID, name, married to, nose, and uh, date of birth. This data can be transferred to knowledge graph and ontology using the settler language. So now let's see a few of the industries where the semantic infrastructure has really helped them. The first one is the manufacturing industry. So here we see that we have two processes. First one is process related to application A, and the second one is process related to application B. What do we see? That application A has three concepts, material, stock, and resources. And pro application B has three terms, workpiece, resource, and machine tool. And if we look very carefully, we'll see both of them share one common term, that's resource. But the resource means something else in both these applications. Moreover, we'll see that both of them have the same concept work in progress, but that is represented using material in uh, process A and workpiece in process B. So if in a normal world, when we give someone two documents to map them and match them, the first thing they do is 
see the common terms and match them without even thinking what they can mean and that was a main problem for manufacturing say over here if someone just connects resource to resource they are actually connecting two very different uh, concepts so the major challenge for manufacturing industry was interoperability as we saw they are same terms with different meanings and different terms uh, having the same meaning moreover people might say that why can't we just use natural language to define them and that should be good enough but the problem is in natural language when we are using those definitions by itself can be ambiguous it might not give us the actual information the semantic meaning that we want and when these manufacturing industries when they are creating any models they try to make it very unique for their particular application so that it can't be reused so frequently that we really want in normal uh, day to day life the last one is because all of these applications have their own uh, models so we need translators point to point translators to translate each of them to make sure that people are understanding what the manufacturers are trying to say and not miss and there's no miscommunication happening and for that they require n square translators for every n applications and that's huge so what is the solution simple use ontology develop a taxonomy or ontology which can have manufacturing concepts and what is a benefit because it will be now using the semantic meaning may whatever you define that with but if the concept is the same with the uh, system that you have built it matches the, that concept then it knows your meaning the same definition and not any other concept and because of uh, this uh, ontology and because we are removing unambiguity and everything we are very sure now that we can reduce that n square translators to just two n translator so the here the diagram that we are seeing is the uh, process specification language we we'll look into that process specific language in a minute but this is the architecture that they used to solve this problem that they were facing in the manufacturing uh, industry the psl core is the core ontology that is there and the core theory is actually consisting of all the axioms that is used to infer and uh, work on that and then we can have extension on it so what was the aim of the process specification language it was to create a neutral standard language for process specification to serve as an interlingua to integrate multiple process related applications throughout the manufacturing life cycle as we just discussed how it is helping and it also says that this interchange language is unique due to the formal semantic definitions that underlie the language and because it's very explicit and there is no unambiguous definitions therefore we don't have to deal with the hidden assumptions and the subjective mappings that we have and that is why this really helped the processing uh, the whole manufacturing department throughout the manufacturing life cycle and they did not had to deal with resource here is something else and resource there means something else now this is the translation to from psl diagram that they used and over here the, there are two basic concepts that we need to keep in mind one is the syntactic translation and the other one is the semantic mapping the syntactic translation was done using the knowledge using the knowledge interchange format and uh, so what is happening say application a whatever we have the process that is the terminology is just changed to the kif syntax so in this way the terminology the underlying terminology is still the same is just changing that to a, a particular format which we can use later once this syntactic translation is done that is when we have the ontology and we have all the concepts with the definition the semantic definition stored over there so we we match them we match the terminology meaning and what is stored in our ontology once that is done that is replaced in my this terminology so now i have my application a terminology which is mapped to the ontology now what is happening next is this is for process a and that is been mapped to process b for process b it's the reverse that is taking place first is the sem uh, semantic thing happening and then the syntax so let's see an example 
is the KIF for resource one. And just to refresh your memory, we are still looking at this particular example. Okay, where we are, where we know that uh, material in application A is similar to workpiece in application B. Stock in A is same as resource in B, and resource in A is same as machine tool in B. Okay. To get clear idea, let's just focus on the resource thing. We know resources used in both these uh, applications, so just let's look at that. Over here in application A's terminology, we have inject mold, which is a kind of resource. It is then converted to a quantified uh, statements uh, uh, using KIF. And now for each of them, for resource inject mold, we know that for all, uh, inject mold is a part of resource. This is the first step, the syntactic translator that is happening. Now, the semantic mapping that is happening. In an ontology, in an ontology, we know that this resource, the description, the, uh, the definition of resource matches to the uh, definition of machine in our ontology. So that is why that resource is being mapped to machine. Now, this is getting converted for application B. So we started with uh, syntactic uh, mapping and then we went to the, uh, from syntactic translator, we went to the semantic mapping. Now we are going from semantic mapping to syntactic translator. Now the semantic mapping is done. What is happening in our ontology, machine uh, definition is same as the application B's machine tool. And if you remember, in our process also it showed that resource in A is same as machine tool in B. So see, with that machine, we are mapping the resource in A to machine tool in B. Once this semantic mapping is done, we move to the syntactic uh, translation. So in all this translation, we have still mapped all those uh, same similar items from both the processes, keeping the terminology intact. So here, it might seem it's a very um, heavy work, but it's not. It's just using the rules and the axioms which is present in our system and then mapping them. So it's very quick, especially when we look at a very large scale. It becomes very easy to map and see and connect uh, data from different resources and try to find out something new, valuable information that we can get from that. So we yeah. have a couple of questions. So <clears throat> these are um, for both application A and application B. These are just declarative things that get interpreted um, by however application because all they are is just um, it's just a data structure just listening yes. listing stuff and presumably it knows what it's supposed to do with that list of stuff. Right? It's yes. not, it doesn't. It's not saying what to do. It's just here, here's some information about what you're supposed to be doing. And, um, and then you're breaking it down into this intermediate form, right. which, is, which is your point, right? um, doing that semantic mapping to something that, that's more like a vocabulary and more like a um, uh, more similar to what we how we usually think of it, the kind of a class hierarchy. Right. Type of thing. Yes. So it's just using the KIF mm -hmm. uh, language. Mm -hmm. And then just mm -hmm. converting that into syntax. And once it has done that conversion, it just uses that to map it. To just see whether they are the, whichever the similar uh, definitions they get it, mm -hmm. they just replace that with the ontology terms. So that is easier to map and match two different uh, concepts from two, sorry, match the similar concepts from two different processes and say that they are actually the same thing. Does PSL actually include? Because this is not workflow, but does PSL actually have a, a part of its syntax describing workflows to yes. actual sequences or stuff? Yes. Okay. They have all these axioms and everything that they have in store no, and how they work. Part. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, we see the railway industry. In this railway industry, I'll be focusing on the railway industry in UK which is a very recent one, which has actually used ontology. So now let's see the challenges that they had. Uh, in the railway industry, they, with the onset of so many technologies that is there, 
they themselves have an information system apart from them at least 20 more suppliers are using more than 130 different kinds of information system so we can see the data is actually spread across around 131 information system and until unless we don't combine them it might not be useful so what is happening is the uh, the government wants to know uh, they want to actually control the monitoring they want to know that if there is a bridge that the train is crossing will that require any uh, replacement or will that require to be repaired and can we know that earlier because just replacing or repairing a bridge has so many different factors related to it the first one being the money the cost and this money is coming from the tax that people are paying so how can they minimize the use of that second one if they are planning to replace it do they have the parts ready if not by when can they expect the parts to be there will that be too late for the by when they get the parts or no and then how many lines will be affected say there are like 10 uh, trains using that bridge how will they be affected how can we incorporate all those laws that is happening the other thing is like can we say when the train is approaching a particular station can we just say which track this train passed and how many signals were there how many delays will each signal give and can we provide that information to our consumers so all these different predictive maintenance customer information and forward planning this actually created a situation where the regulatory body was um, of the of uk rail wanted to know the current state of asset conditioning monitoring that they have and because they are all heterogeneous sources mm -hmm. so it was becoming very challenging for them to convert from an infrastructure centric industry to a data driven industry that is what they were looking for so but this wasn't the first ontology in the railway industry. We had different ontologies which were uh, working in a different uh, for different problems. But because they wanted to do just not uh, integrate the data, but also come up with such a uh, which more knowledge and information which can help them for predictions and other stuff. So they decided to create a railway code ontology which will demonstrate how semantic data models can be used in the real industry. And because we're using ontology and linked data, it can also help in increasing technology driven railway systems. This will also help to overcome some of the limitations like the scalability, reasoning performance and expressivity. Why scalability? Like we just uh, took an example of the bridge. Say if you're just looking at a small area, then we know, okay, manually we can check each part, whether it's present or it's not present, and we can do it. It will take some time, but we can still work on it. But when it's in a large scale, then if a person tries to manually account each asset by asset, it will not only take a long time, but it might become impossible for a person to do it. And maybe by the time they complete the whole manual accounting, accounting of the assets, the bridge has fallen. So what? So there are so many different factors that comes into play uh, where ontology is actually helping and we'll see in a moment. Also, they initially, the, uh, they used to use their uh, XML document, which they called Rail ML. But when they are using that, the problem over there is in tags, you can just insert tags as in where you want it. But they in no way express the semantic meaning of what you're trying to say. So that is why XML was not working that well. So uh, I assume because it was a government project, that is why they don't have a lot of infrastructure images available. Even in their paper, which I found, which is like 44 pages long, I could get everything, but the images were missing. These were the only three images which I got of Raccoon Ontology. So here we see they had an upper ontology which just explained the basic concepts. And then they drilled down uh, in different domains. One of which was like rolling stock, the other was like timetable and other stuff. 
so what they did they created this ontology in a way where all my lower level ontologies or the sub ontology are dependent on my upper level ontology but in no way will my upper level ontology be dependent on any of its uh, lower level ontologies to add uh, to add provenance it actually used the uh, prov ontology that is there and it uh, for namespaces they try to use non domain namespaces wherever possible so that it can be reused and it can be accessible by a large uh, number of people so what was the outcomes of the raccoon ontology it gave us a generic railway concepts moreover it provided us so uh, sub ontologies for infrastructure time tabling rolling stocks so what is happening with each one of them with this infrastructure they are actually getting to know the whole infrastructure of the railway from where to where the train can go what is the structure uh, what is the line and uh, if there is damage and all for time tabling that is when will the uh, train reach a particular stop so earlier it was seen that with their earlier systems when they tried to have a time table it was not that accurate because most of the time there was a time lag one system used to get updated and that used to uh, in turn update another system which added time lags and which was a problem between the communication with the passengers and uh, the administrations so time tabling what is happening is like if a train is stuck somewhere it actually just updates it automatically and then people get to know in real time what the um, where the train is and when they will reach and all those uh, information rolling stock is for say they want to change a bridge and something and they want to see what is there in their stock so because of ontology now all the stock all throughout uk is there in the ontology and when the uh, um and whenever the maintenance people want to access uh, one of those assets they can just look at the ro rolling stock see where is it if it is present and then work accordingly so what did the what did the whole um, sorry yeah so the um, what did i say sorry the creators of raccoon ontology they actually use the inference agents and they uh, portrayed that we can always show which lines will be affected if there is a mechanical failure of railway switches so this can actually be uh, passed over to the passengers to the drivers of the train and all which will keep everyone in sync it could also as we discussed it could also say the physical location of the assets which could be used by the maintenance team now with this the whole system uh they discussed with their stakeholders and the stakeholders were like uk's infrastructure manager the net net uh, network rail and large engineering firms among others so with them they saw that they did not only saved money but they also improved passenger perceptions and where did they save money in a lot of way they by more uh, efficient maintenance by lower cost incurred due to equipment failure less staff time wasted manually compiling reports and less long term it expenditure and why was this happening because they created this ontology and they could now use their experience to predict what can be there and based on that prediction they could start uh, planning accordingly and get things fixed on time and this because uh, they could now have a proper time table and communicate better with the passengers it actually improved the passenger perception towards them and the reliability or and the reliability of this timetable and the whole railway system actually increased the ridership and it also helped them with um, with the freight traffic and controlling them so this is one which i really like because this is just not looking at uh, integration of data but actually working with this in real life and helping the whole um, railway community in uk okay um material science in material science this is called the uh, material tetrahedron because the whole material science is based on four things the structure property performance and processing 
it is just built on this tetrahedron so uh, it is said that structure property and processing is connected and change in one can affect others so for every material scientist this is a basic thing which they have to understand and go ahead and over here only we see the challenges because it's material it can be any kind it can be a simple material it can be a polymer it can be a meta material it can be two dimensional it can be three dimensional it can be isomorphic it can be anisomorphic so structures can be so varied and different and to store them you might need different uh, formats so that is one challenge with processing they have tons of different kinds of processing and a combination of those processing so most of the uh, work that we see they always focus on one kind of processing or couple uh, processing and couple structures to keep it simple and still work because that itself becomes very complicated based on that we have properties every structure and the way it is processed creates a different property so you might be using the same material but based on its structure and process its property might change and if that changes it affects performance directly so they are also interrelated that a little change in one can change the others and affect them so this is a nanomine ontology this was created at our lab and this is for polymer nano composites so what they were doing here is they were looking at the three main components of the tetrahedron the structure property and the process and they try to get all the polymer nano composite at one place they use the xml uh, because they are material scientists and they generally use xml format for their polymer nano composite uh, domain so they had all these data in xml and then we created an ontology where we showed that polymer nano composite has part filler and matrix matrix is the structure say a um, square that is created by a one component and it is filled by another so that's the filler so that is how we are getting and they are all uh, relations it might it can also have processing like this is just one tenth of the whole processing that they have in their system and we can see this is itself so very complicated and this is just one part so that is why ontology is so helpful because now they can get all their mappings and augmentation inserted in the data in just one format in whatever format all these researchers are working on that can be now converted to ontology and stored in this uh, uh, stored in as a knowledge graph and not only that it helps them to visualize whatever they want in a in a way that they want they can customize their visualization uh, template and they can also use this to search and create discover new uh, materials like new nano uh, nanomine polymer nano composites so this also helped us like because it was uh, we started creating ontology and knowledge graph for it 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 was easy for us to extend it to include meta materials and make this as a materials mine ontology which will now have a uh, like polymer nano composites that is available um, naturally and meta materials is like all simulated materials that they need to find so uh, which is always based on the geometry of it so this geometry can be 2d and 3d and it can be very large it can be very large file which is very difficult to store and also to just connect between each others so that is where ontology is really really helping us to just convert and see that okay one is xml one is uh, just a normal csv file how can we just match them and see what new structures can be formed or what new materials can be um, discovered from them so yeah this is that Yeah. Uh, so what they do is they have these properties and effective properties so say in meta materials when they have two different materials that is being used to create meta material now they want to see, uh, find with this property they are looking they want some property and they want some effective property value say young's modulus and position ratio they want a particular value for both of them so they can go and search whichever material 
can uh, whichever currently uh, meta materials are present which have these values now using those values and different materials that they want to search they can combine them because they do simulations they can use simulations combine those uh, materials and see what is coming if that is already present or not present or if that can be used for something productive in the real world because at the end the main uh, usage of finding new materials or any kind of material is using them in different forms by say just uh, making your eye uh, glasses or something else where they can be used for the benefit of humans so that is where it is yeah sorry if it's too soon <laughs> but uh, so yeah we saw how semantically enabled infrastructure really helps to integrate data resources we saw three different domains one was manufacturing industry where we saw mainly the process specification language then we saw the railway industry the especially focusing on the uk rail industry where they created the uh, raccoon the railway core ontology and then we saw the material science domain where they are where they have created uh, nano mine and materials mine and it is coming to our notice that semantic technology helps in these four things like for interoperability of data and in scalability in reuse of the models and in reasoning capabilities because uh, semantics because ontology and all they focus more on logics so where we have logics and axiom we can it's easier for us to infer from them and get new knowledge so it actually helps us in all these four uh, in many of them yes questions so i had um, one could you go back to i think on the first raccoon slide raccoon <clears throat> you introduced it i think oh, yeah i want to see where the no the, the one where there's the citation I, I just the citation to, is this one which one looking Where are those guys from? Uh, University of K. Sorry, I'll just check. Okay. I was just curious if there was some, some people I know over there. <laughs> yeah, I remembered, but sorry, I just forgot. They are from Univers University of Birmingham. 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 Yes. Birmingham, yeah, that makes sense. That's, yeah. Um, so it, it's interesting. That this is more of a general. So you go back to your your, your sort of your summary slide of the whole. Your, yeah, the, the big one, the big bug. Um, in each of these cases, mm -hmm. the, the the three areas, you're essentially that the exercises in capturing. A domain ontology mm -hmm. from uh, from existing structures for managing the information in the domain in different yes. ways. Uh, yes. Sort of getting to the um, in the, the first case, it's it's based on PSL and mm -hmm. those structures. Uh, the, the second is based on uh, essentially, I guess, XML that they ship around, right? So, yes. Yeah. And, and then kind of the same with the third material science is based on XML structures for XML is for nano mine for materials mine it's CSV. Okay, okay. So that's that's much looser. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so, yeah. so I'm wondering, you know, based on your experience mm -hmm. experiences here, um, our work in various projects are uh, capturing domain specific ontologies building what what um I, I guess you see both sides of it what what sort of similarities what sort of differences um uh, what uh, as you look at and we have read those papers that describe mm -hmm. these different things are there ways that they could have done that better more efficiently if they had our methods are there what can we learn what they've done they have done so the material science one is done by us mm -hmm. 
Instagram. Yeah, where we are actually using the settler and other technologies that was developed at uh, WC. And the first one, I, I personally really like the railway core ontology because uh, like in process specification language, they were just trying to map things and see whether they are same so that they can uh, interrelate and just integrate the data. But in railway core ontology, they're just not doing that. They're doing much further. They are taking a step further. They have created a big one and then they're creating some small ones specifically for that domain. Like just not the whole domain, railway domain, but just like timetable, just assets, right. where they are using them for predictions also. Like they know what is there and what can happen. So is this actually, um, and is this in production? Or is this yeah, this is working. That's that's actually working. So yes. the, the British railways are running on yes. ontologies. That is how they help it. So, so talk a little, what more do you know about the infrastructure that they're using? I mean, what, whose triple stores are they using? What, what, uh, well, I, Good question. I mean, it's really not on top of my head currently. Are they even using actual RDF for Yes, they are using RDF. Just the ontology model for it. Great. No, they have the ontology model and they are using RDF. For the data. For converting the data, whatever is there, into RDF to represent that as an ontology. That so they are not using the ontology just for annotations, they are actually doing it. Yes. It's just not like, okay, this is a schema and this is what is there but they're actually converting their information to uh, RDF and then showing. Because I remember, uh, if I remember correctly, in one of their papers, they did have this um, triples showing the time of a train or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did have that example. What's I the, did see that. What's, what are the, the scale, you know, in our raccoon example, what, how, how big are the that we're talking about. Do you have any clue? I think it's 600 classes or so. Just, I can check. Oh, well, that's, you're talking about the ontology. That's, that's yes, incredible. but they have not mentioned the specific uh, data that is there. Oh, okay. Because uh, in one paper where they're actually talking about how they came up with the use cases and the different scenarios, over there they're just explaining the three uh, ontologies which I showed, that is where yeah. they're explaining them. And in the other paper, which is like 44 pages long, where they are actually discussing how this helped. So that was a follow-up paper to this right. earlier one. And then they're going into D. So yeah, so I tried the, going there and it's in my annotation of geography, but not, yeah. So on the, the manufacturing mm -hmm. industry thing, that's that's kind of interesting unto itself. You yes. know, we've, the lab has done some work which know about a, a few years ago working on additive manufacturing mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, Johnson Samuels lab and our lab were doing some things essentially trying to capture knowledge about additive manufacturing which is 3d printing you know. okay. when, when Boeing does it it's called additive manufacturing when, mm -hmm. when someone does it in a garage is 3d printing <laughs> um, but constructing building ontologies to characterize additive manufacturing workflows and information and certainly knowledge graphs that, that document that and then using that for various purposes, including trying to deduce errors, uh, problems, mm -hmm. where, where are manufacturing defects happening if we include manufacturing information, you know, sensor mm -hmm. data that were from as we're manufacturing, putting that into the graph and trying to the model and to understand where things yes. So I did see a um, few papers which were using PSL, specifically mm -hmm. in the business domain when they are trying to use this process information and then building on top of it yeah. based on their problem. And it was really helping them. And it was used in a very uh, different ways, which is not directly on top of my head now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, uh, they they were using it. It was really used in a very, because this is 1999 papers. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I decided to choose this because this is one of the like groundbreaking papers. Like that time they did not have anything of this sort. And once they created this, a lot of people have been using them or building their own uh, infrastructure based on this. Well, 
Well, that's about one. PSL. Yes. And by the semantification of PSL, it's, yes. that's kind of an extrapolation that you can look at. Yeah, I was just saying why I chose yeah. this. No, 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 that's a, no, it's, it's, it's a good example. I mean, I, I, I mean it, it makes sense to, to, to go there. So here's a question. Where are you going to take this? What, what, oh, this yeah. is kind of a review. Yeah, so I, yeah, I was trying to review, like, uh, as you started saying that my research field is towards um, semantically enabled infrastructure for data, right. integrated data, uh, data. So that is what I was trying to see how it has been used in different domains and what is there which they have not done, or maybe the process that they have done and I can use in mine, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm reading. I'm I'm also re I have also read papers in biomedical domain in image annotation tools and like other domains. But uh, for this talk, I decided just to be on these three because mainly if you see the connection, all of these manufacturing or railway, they all need material in some way. And my focus is towards material science currently. So <coughs> for me, this was really very connecting because mm -hmm. uh, as I said, in the material science where they have this tetrahedron processing is one of the main thing. And that is where process specification language where I thought I should be looking at because that might be helpful for me in some way. I don't know yet what way because I'm still uh, looking into it. So that is why I wanted to dare, dig deep into it and see what is happening. Can one of it help me in some way? That can be X, Y anyway. So that is why this was important. So my all my terms were like materials related to material when I was searching and I got these papers. And when I was reading them and I was finding, I was like, okay, they are doing something similar. They are creating, uh, they know that, okay, they have these problems and that can be solved using only semantics. So, so there must be, um, I mean, this, this whole field, mm -hmm. that, uh, advanced manufacturing now, that's really, and I know that RPI is really big time into this, this whole thing. So there, that must be a, uh, you know, a core aspect of advanced manufacturing is, is information management. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's part of what empowers them. So it seems like there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that can be done in that space. There's probably a lot of work that has been done. Yes. Uh, so just in the polymer uh, nanocomposites and all, which yeah. is which is relatively new in the material science domain, there's a lot of work done. But as I said, they are they are all just seeing like the tensile uh, tensile property. They're just looking at one property or two property or couple of properties. Yeah. And still we can't have all and because they're researchers we all have our own methods we all have our own ways to store and do our work so it's very difficult to do an interoperability or just see what a person has and what other person has done and maybe what this person is looking for is already done by someone else but they're not able to get to it how can they do it so yeah. we have to stop being just one or two we need everything together at one place which was missing and that is why this nano mine was done yeah. So there are work done, but it's just like what is missing from that work. And that is what we are trying to do. And if something is there, we are trying to reuse that. So it's easier and that's always good. Other questions, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess sort of like talking about the mapping everything together. So the first part that you were discussing mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at, you know, sort of mapping the terminology from two different applications together, is that something you're looking to do like on the fly? given like, oh, here's a reason, here's uh, application A, here's application B, tell me like in a short term, you know, mm -hmm. what what overlaps, what maps to what in these two cases. And so on the fly thing, are you looking at like, okay, you know, I guess in like a longer term, like we want to make a mapping, does that make sense? Yes. Just sort of like not a quick thing versus like- I It's guess, a long term. Okay. It's, it's a not a quick thing. one. It's a long term thing. So that whenever, because as, uh, as I mentioned over there, that these models are so unique that they can't be reused, right? Yeah. But because of these mappings now, you can see which part of the model you may reuse mm -hmm. because that is matching to what you're wanting. Mm -hmm. They they might have a different term for it, mm -hmm. but it's exactly what you're looking for. Okay. So sort of like you can be like, okay, I'm application C, what terminology mm -hmm. already exists. Yes. Okay. And, and then you can use it. And like just to like not be basic white girl, but what does PSL stand for when it's not pumpkin spice latte again? Oh, so I didn't <laughs> mention that. You didn't. I forgot. Process. About it's process. 
process specification language. Okay, thank you. Because it's specifying, it's a language for specifying okay. processes. Yeah, okay, cool. Yes. I'm sorry, I was just like all That's fine. <laughs> no, uh, I just thought that maybe I did not mention that, sorry. You, you did, but like I said, I forgot. Like, yeah, it's process specification it's language. Process specification language. Yes. But, but is there a pumpkin spice latte ontology? Well, no, pumpkin there spice? Be. There should be a latte <laughs> ontology. ontology. Which yeah, might have, have pumpkin spice. Terms for depending on the time of the day and like what, yeah. Okay, yeah, Jason. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like that. Yes. And maybe, John, if you have more information on that. What? Like About this. old time uh, RDFics. <laughs> yeah, because I did some research and I was just reading at what KIF is and their syntax and all. Yeah, so we, we kind of have to think about imagine a world. <laughs> um, so in the, the late 80s and 90s, there were um, people understood that you needed to do the things that we've seen are pretty natural today. That you needed to have ways to express uh, what we call ontologies for the reasons that we say. You know, and, and, you know, I've really outlined that, you know, this uh, semantic interoperability, all this kind of stuff. And, but that was a world where you know, everybody and his sister were building systems that were not, they were doing the same thing, but were not compatible. So you, how do you bridge those? You, and, and how do you how do you bridge those those gaps? How do you build that infrastructure? What's the nature? This is a world without web. Okay, you know, we're we're talking about a world without web, um, a world with barely with the internet. And certainly an internet that's not used in the way we're talking about. So, um, and also a world where proprietary systems were, yes. were pervasive, okay, and where and the, the urgent need to be able to send stuff to somebody else's system and have it work was not obvious, okay. It wasn't obvious to vendors that they should accept other people's formats, okay, because if I'm accepting this format, I'm helping him out. Why, why would I want to do that? I want him to fail so they're going to buy my system. Okay, so I've got my system on both sides. Okay, so it's a, so people were, were creating these different things. And in the 90s, we started to see XML as, as sort of a, a way to exchange information between these you know, between business systems and government systems and the government started to establish these and started to establish XML data types or DTDs as the uh, as the way to sort of have so it's, it's kind of an electronic document kind of exchange thing where we're exchanging data as so was documents, we're marking those out. Those are still application specific. So if you have a common structure, I'll give you an XML document, my system your system will, will be able to parse my system, and if it's got a DTD, well, it's, there's hope to make sense of it, but it's still, you know, ultimately, your system has to have like the same understanding of these elements as my system. Then you get into uh, this notion of, of ontologies where you're actually binding things together in mean, where, and, and this is really the importance of that application after the application A thing is you're explicitly saying, I'm going to send you this. It's going to be in a different format. You're going to figure out how to parse it, but also I'm going to send it to you. It's going to have different words, but they mean we're, we're anchoring those together. Okay. And that's where you started to have this exchange of meaning as well as an exchange of bits. Um, and then, uh, and then Nixon, you know, 1980, March 1989 happens, Tim Berners Lee's, Lee's famous memo happens. Let's give it everybody, dogs and cats living together, total chaos, and, and now we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, you know, gets a piece. All right, so let's thank you. Know,